We have a video now showing the underpinning operation, which uh, in this case is the installation of needle beams to pick up the load, the concentrated load of the column. This view shows the jacking arrangement used to transfer loads into the needle beams. It is essential to preload and pre-deflect the needle beams. You do not want the load of the bridge coming onto the needle beam and then uh, settling. So this is a very important principle to preload all of the temporary structure first before the load is transferred. When the load is transferred there should be zero movement. And this is a good time to remind you that even in supportive excavation, when you have a deep excavation with significant loads, you preload all of the struts for the same reason. You don't want uh, any movement of that side wall, the supportive excavation wall. So you preload the strut, which in effect uh, also preloads the whaler and takes out any uh, sloppiness in the connections. You do all of that first to avoid any movement of the adjoining ground. Also the, the jacks in this case were installed at the ends of the beams so they're actually going to lift up the ends of the beams and that will create a small space on top of this stack of shim plates. So you need to have at your disposal some very thin shimming material to fill that space and then you can let the jacks relax and the load will come down on those shim plates. All of that has to be prepared in advance. Here you can see the temporary tower that's been erected to carry the needle beams and the two iron workers are actually standing on the needle beams. They're using a clamp on the existing bridge to help them uh, set the needle beams uh, precisely in place. It's uh, really impossible because of the low headroom to get a crane to handle the beams and so they're taking advantage of the existing structure and they'll use a chain fall or some other device to help them uh, set the beams precisely. You can roughly set them with uh, this machine. You can call that a low overhead crane but it actually looks much more like a forklift and in fact it's supporting the needle beams from below so it's not really uh, over the load uh, hanging from a hook there's, there's just no room to do that so this is actually working from underneath the needle beams that's a man lift going up in the background a very quick way to uh, put a man in place now we're a little more advanced the needle beams are actually in place at this time. And of course that's the column that's going to be removed just to the left of the ladder. So the whole idea is to transfer the load onto the needle beams. When you've done that you can then remove the column. And again the process being used here requires that the columns be removed to create a space for the construction of the new abutment. So this is somewhat uh, an unusual approach. On the far side of the roadway you can see similar arrangements of temporary towers and needle beams. There are two additional existing column, columns which uh, need to be removed. Here you can see two iron workers at work, a uh, very, very cramped, uh, crowded space. And they are making uh, final adjustments to the beams and uh, attaching them by field drilling some holes and bolting them together. You need a very stable uh, 
structure before you transfer load onto it. Again, you can see the existing columns surrounded by the needle beams on either side. And on this end of the structure, you can get a look at the hydraulic jacks that have already been put in place. This is a good view of the hydraulic jack, which is uh, that yellow cylinder on the right, and a stack of steel plates, which is carrying the needle beams. As you introduce the load into the jack, the end of the needle beams will uh, move uh, upward, again by some uh, measurable amount to uh, uh, overcome the deflection in the, in the beam and whatever compression takes place in the temporary tower. Now in this view, the load has been transferred and the existing column is being removed. And there's a very distinctive sound of the uh, laborers uh, breaking the concrete. The whole world calls that a jackhammer. The uh, whole world is wrong. That's actually a pavement breaker. So now you've uh, learned something that you won't learn anyplace else. There are two different tools and they look alike and they sound alike. The pavement breaker breaks concrete so it's easy to remember that tool. The jackhammer is actually a rotating tool and it drills holes. So if you were uh, drilling holes in rock and you were going to introduce uh, blasting, you would use a jackhammer to drill the hole and then you fill the hole with uh, dynamite and you can blast the rock. So the tool being used here is a pavement breaker. In this view, the column is gone. Uh, it was not all taken down with pavement breakers. That would take forever. But the pavement breakers needed to be used to carefully remove the top of the column, which is still joined to the existing bridge. Once it was free from the existing bridge, then much, much more robust uh, tanky braking tools could be used to speed up the removal. On the far side of the bridge, uh, two existing columns have been removed, so now there is space on both sides for the construction of the new abutment. I took a shot here of the underside of the existing bridge where the old column stood, to show you this arrangement, there are four anchor bolts which uh, join the column to the bridge. You can see those. And there's a kind of a cylindrical can at the end of each anchor bolt. Uh, that's a detail that's used which will allow you to make some s small adjustment to the location of the anchor bolt. When you try to fit a steel bearing plate over it, you might find that it's off by a fraction of an inch. And this gives you some small leeway to adjust the location of the anchor bolt and allow you to fit it up to the uh, bearing plate. This is a very nice detail.